Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, Scholars for so Social Justice webinar on austerity, racial capitalism, and the university. My name is Sarah Haley and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we launch into this important topic, I'll say a bit about Scholars for Social Justice or SSJ. SSJ is a collective of progressive scholars committed to promoting and fighting for a political agenda that insists on justice for all, especially the most vulnerable. SSJ sees campuses and universities as crucial sites for struggle and contestation and mobilizes the knowledge, skills, and resources of scholars to battle repressive attacks on marginalized communities. Um, advancing an agenda of social justice. And we have an exciting year ahead of webinars like this and other initiatives that we'll be launching soon. So um, to learn more and sign up for updates, you can go to scholarsforsocialjustice.com. The university is a major arena for the expansion of knowledge and political infrastructures that entrench racial capitalism. Our current moment is an ominous one. We know that crisis is an, op is an opportunity for colleges and universities to make permanent restructuring changes that accelerate the casualization of academic labor, intensify the racial and gender hierarchies of value upon which the academy depends and operates. But this is also a moment of vibrant organizing and I'm thinking about movements of graduate workers organizing for a living wage in the UC system through UC for COLA or cost of living adjustment, the debt collective movement, which organizes student debt, debt strikes and helps um, propel college for all legislation, free college tuition, um, nationwide movements for university police divestment, campaigns for reparations from universities, investment in slavery and ongoing economic arrangements of racial capitalism. And these more recent campaigns join the long-standing organizing among university janitorial maintenance, clerical and technical staff, as well as the teaching staff, especially adjuncts and lecturers and TAs. Most recently, we see inspiring organizing at the University of Chicago, where faculty have refused hollow appeals to diversity or representational inclusion, say, in the administrative infrastructure, and instead have demanded the deep and expansive structural change that valuing, truly valuing Black lives requires. So today, to get us started, I will introduce each participant in the order in which uh, we'll, they'll speak. They'll offer some opening thoughts on the topic and then we'll move into questions and discussion. And so please send your questions to Facebook Live or post them in the chat. Our first speaker is Destin Jenkins who works at the University of Chicago, a rare institution so endowed that it has named assistant professorships, which surely suggests it can provide a community benefits agreement for its development, fully fund its departments and centers for the study of race and devote resources to remediate the harm from historical investments in slavery. And Destin holds one of these assistant named professorships. He's the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor in US History and the college, and is a historian of racial capitalism. His recent article in The Nation asks what it really means to invest in black communities, providing a crucial and intricate analysis of municipal finance in relation to demands for the redirection of resources from punishment to social infrastructures for Black life. His first book is forthcoming. Uh, it's titled Bonds of Equality, sorry, The Bonds of Inequality, Debt and the Making of the Modern American City. And it explores the paradoxes of municipal debt, focusing on San Francisco. Devarian Baldwin will be next. He is the Paul E. Rayther Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College. His academic and political commitments have focused on global cities and particularly the diverse and marginalized communities that struggle to maintain sustainable lives in urban locales. He is the author of Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity, the Great Migration and Black Urban Life and co-editor with Minka Makalani of the essay collection, Escape from New York, the New Negro Renaissance and Beyond Harlem. 
and he's currently working on two um, book projects. Um, Frank Deal is professor of law at the CUNY Law School. For 14 years, he was a staff member for the Center for, the, for Constitutional Rights, where he served su successively as staff attorney, associate legal director, and legal director. He has published articles in the New York University Review of Law and Social Change, New York Law School Journal of Human Rights, Socialist Review, International Policy Review, and in books dealing with employment discrimination and international labor rights, including human rights and international trade. Finally, we'll hear from Barbara Vereen, who is the organizing director of Unite Here Local 34, the Yale University Clerical and Technical Workers Union. She is also a member of Unite Here's Black Leadership Committee, which has done important work within the labor movement to frame economic justice as a battle to end racism, sexism, xenophobia, and homophobia. It's really crucial work in the labor movement right now. She's organized extensively in local political and economic justice campaigns in New Haven, as well as nationally in contract fights for workers in the hospitality industry. And I had the honor of working with Barbara for several months in Detroit on an airport concessions organizing workers contract fight. And I'm just in awe of her organizing. She recently published an op-ed in the New Haven Register that elucidates this current moment as an opportunity for Yale to provide good jobs rather than kind of hiding behind the austerity in moments of economic precariousness. Okay, um, Destin. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and good afternoon, good morning to everybody tuning in. Thank you for being here. I don't know, maybe even good evening for those of you outside of the United States in a different time zone. Um, let me just sort of thank, uh, begin by thanking SSJ, Kathy Cohen, Adam Gattachu for the invitation, uh, Terry Smith for setting up the whole conversation, and my co-panelists, really delighted to be here. It's a pleasure, pleasure to, to speak with you all today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the, the work of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, who are engaged in a campaign against the University of Chicago, as well as at other institutions. Uh, to me, the, 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 the point, as I understand that campaign, is not to answer once and for all, are universities really racist, as a, a, an article recently appeared in the Chronicle, uh, as if that's the key question. But rather, as I understand it, one of the objections is to chip away at the kinds of stories universities like to tell about themselves. Uh, and as one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago reminded me, it's the point is to disable the university's ability to project itself as uh, having been uh, and always and, and still continues to be an anti-racist diverse space. So uh, my comments today are in service of this project of disablement and disarmament. So I don't have much time, so I just kind of want to get into a, a bit of an argument or maybe a hypothesis, I suppose. Uh, and that is this, uh, the tax exempt status of universities contributes to local budgetary pressures. That privileged status also makes calls for greater community investment more difficult. And of course, I'm thinking here of the divest invest movement. Uh, more to the point, the special status effectively siphons resources from surrounding local communities and municipal governments. And in a context of severe revenue shortfalls, these governments are then forced to uh, impose austerity, which falls heaviest on the poor, working class, black and brown residents uh, in the surrounding community. And so basically you could say that there's austerity within the university for non-tenure track faculty and staff, uh, and it's austerity beyond the university for public sector workers and the like. And you can imagine a household in which someone works for the university subject to austerity and their partner works in a public sector who, again, are also subjected to the conditions of austerity, all sort of rooted perhaps, not principally, but no doubt uh, relatedly to the tax exempt status of universities. Uh, and so among other vectors, the imposition of austerity by local governments, I'd suggest, triggers accumulation for debt collectors, payday lenders, and the like. So there's the kind of capitalism and the racial capitalism. So of course, as we know, uh, universities play many roles and assumes a number of identities and DeVarian Baldwin really is the man to, to really kind of elaborate uh, on this point. Uh, but as we know, right, universities are property owners, they're landlords, uh, they're borrowers that turn to financial markets, they're employers, they're research centers, they're the sites of knowledge production in the form of labs and also circulation uh, when we think about libraries. Uh, and given the endowments of R1s, Research One institutions, the overlapping law enforcement agencies that safeguard and advance their interests, 
and the privileged access to water, energy, among other public utility services, you might even say the universities function as many nation states. Uh, in distinct but related ways, each of these roles shape and are shaped by racial capitalism and care, not cops, really kind of punctuates the point between racial capitalism and policing. Uh, and, and as we know, thanks to, to the work from the reparations at UChicago, uh, the working group there has shown that these connections run deep. Uh, so slavery, you could say, was thus foundational both to the formation of the United States and some of the most powerful R1 universities in the United States. So um, in addition to university property holdings, employer-employee relations, and the dark connections between research and policing, we might also focus in on the, overlooked, the often overlooked issue of public finance. So we might focus on how universities deprive surrounding communities of funds that might go to improve public services and community investment. That is, we might see the university as actually a bulwark against the divest invest movement. And I'm, again, I'm thinking here of the, the tax exempt status of universities. So let me say a bit more. So this special status has long been a subject of debate and debates, especially heightened during moments of economic crises. So to uh, quote one journalist from the Chicago Tribune in 1933, quote, the theory is held that those agencies which relieve government of certain obligations, either in ed education or charity, for example, lighten its expenditures. Consequently, they merit some compensation, and this is granted in tax exemption. This is a kind of theory, working theory, of why universities deserve tax exempt status. Uh, and from a normative standpoint, I suppose this status is justified if the institution truly functions as a public good. All right, if it helps to distribute opportunities and resources to a wide swath of the population, independent of race, ethnicity, religion, able body status, gender, and sexual identity, as well as class position. But all too often, universities haven't functioned in this way, as we know. So in December 1978, one Chicago Tribune journalist observed that Psi Epsilon and Delta Epsilon at the University of Chicago enjoyed tax exempt statuses, their fraternity houses. 20 years later, the University of Chicago used the tax exempt municipal bond market to borrow, to build research labs, and to update the university's law school and library. So basically, the university used the tax exempt bond market, which is designed to finance public infrastructure to build private facilities to which the black residents of the South Side did not have access. Uh, so the University of Chicago Police Department, when it claims that it's protecting private property, uh, is in reality, they're protecting property effectively paid for by everyone else. So it's important to kind of disrupt that myth and contention that the University of Chicago is a private institution. I'll say more about that in a bit. Uh, the University of Chicago is not alone in using its privileged tax exempt status to entrench spatial, racial, and class inequalities. And I'm delighted that Barbara's here on the call. Uh, as of March 1993, for instance, 40% of Yale's property was classified as tax exempt. And although Yale, like other nonprofits required by state law, made payments in lieu of ta taxes, this technical term, uh, this was ultimately a small drop in the bucket. Uh, more to the point, the tax exempt holdings of Yale, New Haven Hospital, Wesleyan University, and Trinity College, with we'll sub uh, effectively meant that, to quote one journalist, homeowners are forced to pay a disproportionate share of municipal costs. And I would add, poor and working class residents floated municipal budgets through aggressive fees fares, sales taxes, and such. By 2014, very little had changed. Yale, uh, according to one account, uh, doesn't pay taxes on its dorms, classrooms, libraries, research labs, or the grassy oasis inside the residential quads." End quote. So to be clear, it is not true that universities don't pay taxes. We can't be sloppy with the language there, nor is it the case that they don't make payments in lieu of taxes. Rather, the key questions are, given the billion dollar endowments are these institutions paying their fair share? Are they adequately contributing to the communities of which they are a part? And perhaps the more biting pressing question, to what extent do these institutions distort the very purpose of tax exemption, using their special status to not only further private advantage, but to also expand the university's reach in ways that displace poor black and brown folks who had long been excluded and policed from coming near those institutions to begin with. So personally, I think then we start to think about the political upshot. Personally, I don't think that the solution is to get rid of tax exemption, especially not now during a moment of extreme anti-intellectualism. We know indeed the knuckle scrapers would love to see this. Uh, rather, I think the, the point is to disrupt the private public fiction. 
No matter what these institutions say, their reliance on public lands, the bond market and their tax status means that even the most reputable R1 is in fact a public good. And two, to draw from the efforts of faculty and staff at the University of Pennsylvania, for instance, who have called on UPenn to make increased payments in lieu of taxes to support public schools. I'm thinking of Penn for Pilots, the Penn for Payments in Lieu of Taxes movement. So along with slashing police budgets, which I've discussed elsewhere, and, and folks, of course, uh, have, have really sort of, um, I'm following their lead, People's Budget LA, et cetera, uh, Communities United for Police Reform, et cetera. Uh, so in addition to slashing police budgets, we should demand that these wealthy institutions do more to invest in the public infrastructure and social services of surrounding communities. And of course, not through a sense of noblesse oblige, but by following the lead of community groups on the ground. So thank you for, for your time. Uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. That was really so helpful. Um, Dr. Barry. Okay, can everybody hear me fine? I'm, I'm good. Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as Dustin pointed out, uh, internationally. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's wonderful to be here with these colleagues that are on this panel and um, those that are out there in the, in the ether world. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm almost stunned and, and, and silenced because in a way, Dustin pretty much said everything that I was gonna say and probably better. Um, so, <laughs> uh, this what I'm the remarks I'm going to give today are really going to be kind of a, a um, elaboration on many of the points that Dustin made, with a little bit um, more focus on some points more than others. Um, I was we were all given a task or a call or you know a, a, a directive for this conversation, and um, because of my um, upcoming work um, on universities and urban development um, in the shadow of the Ivy Tower, um, I was asked to talk about university budgets. Um, their austerity strategies and how reparations demands can serve as an important strategy of resistance. So first of all, um, the notion of austerity or claims of austerity is idea that, you know, people are making demands for social justice reforms or transformations and austerity basically saying, we ain't got the money. We can't, we broke, we can't do it. Um, so the biggest task that I want to put forward in the first few minutes is to, is to be very clear that claims of austerity, that we ain't got the money, um, are not based on objective observations of the balance sheet, but they are a tactical strategy for shuttling resources into one budget line as opposed to another. So austerity does not mean we ain't got it. It means we just not giving it to you. Um, so for example, when people talk about austerity, or, or the limits of university budgets, we are probably only talking about maybe half of the political economy of universities. When administrators talk about budgets and their limited ability to redistribute funds, they don't even mention the real estate department, the development office, the technology transfer department, the, the data mining contracts, the university foundation, or even the campus police force. And it's these non-educational divisions that are central to higher education's wealth. Um, and they are central to a process that's always been built on racial capitalism. And this wealth extraction goes back for over a century. Justin mentioned slavery and the work of, you know, Craig Wilder and Marshall Chatelain and the reparations um, at um, University of Chicago Rauch, um, their groups that have talked about how enslavement underwrote university wealth from the inception. But we could go forward talking about the Moral Land Grant, Grant Acts of 1862 and 1890, where uh, indigenous lands were seized and used or sold to build the financial endowment of land grant, but are now being called land grab universities. We could talk about the Cold War era and the building of the military industrial academic complex, where universities were uh, played the lead on not just military research, but becoming the friendly face of urban renewal in displacing and demolishing black and brown communities. But today, the, uh, the function and the formulation of racial capitalism when it comes to universities is organized around something that we call the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy is where academic research is used to create profitable commercial goods in a range of fields from pharmaceutical industries and software products to the military defense weaponry. Key to recruiting the best students, faculty, and their families to do this work of the knowledge economy is based on creating an urbane cluster 
of housing, retail, and nightlife to bring people in. And these urban clusters are built on the exploitation of surrounding communities of color, especially um, on urban campuses. So what we have is a contemporary politics of extraction that become the logical extension of the slavery phenomena, the land grab phenomena, the uh, Cold War realities. So the uh, knowledge economy is just the next level of university-based wealth extraction built on racial capitalism. So colleges and, and universities have become these efficient machines of wealth extraction. On one side, they discuss the cost of educational services. But in boardrooms, they discuss students as consumers, alumni as shareholders, their campus land as a potential tax shelter, and the world beyond the campus as either prime real estate or a dangerous threat to the university brand. The seeming contrast between higher education's lofty pursuits of serving the public, and on the other hand, the hard realities of its financial plundering, this is not a contradiction. It's a business model. Higher education's business model is governed by a presumption that schools are an inherent public good, marked by what Justin Point laid out as its 501c3 tax-exempt status. But this nonprofit designation is precisely what allows for an easier transfer of public dollars into higher education's private developments with little public scrutiny. So let me be clear. The tax designation of universities as educational institutions becomes a powerful financial shelter. This can be seen when looking at a range of avenues or, or, or elements within the university political economy, from students to labor, to endowment, to their property, to their policing. So for our students, we know tuition has skyrocketed. But as we can see with the pandemic, many universities were less concerned with tuition because students were still willing to pay tuition to be associated with the brand of various universities. But what they were most concerned with during the pandemic was the loss of students as a captive consumer base for housing, retail, clothing apparel, and financial services being loans and credit cards. Think about when you were at school or if you've been around a school, the first day of school when you go into those mailboxes, how everyone is stuffed with applications for high interest credit cards. Companies seize on universities as a captive market with the student base. Another aspect of students is graduate student labor. Schools like Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science have this uh, rapacious uh, parasitic relationship between uh, private industry, the university, and their students, their graduate student laborers. Industry gets brilliant cheap labor and tax write-offs because it's called educational costs. Schools get money for equipment, top students, a bunch of money gets dumped into this amorphous uh, category called administrative costs, and they possibly get millions in royalties. What do the students get? They get less than an entry-level worker at the factory if they worked in private industry, and they lose 50% of the intellectual property rights if their research hits on the open market. But beyond students and the rise in contingent faculty, Let's talk about the labor aspect of a low wage ivory tower workforce of medical assistants, janitors, cooks, maintenance, clerical, security staff that keeps these institutions going. They face summertime downsizing without benefits. And many times they work for subcontractors where they get lower wages and are excluded from benefits that are negotiated like housing subsidies. Let's talk about the endowment. The endowment is a tax exempt donations that universities hoard in money market accounts. Harvard's has reached $40 billion. And with these endowments, universities spend more on the financial advisor that manages this money than they do on the university itself. Let's talk about property. Again, in the name of education, schools pay virtually no property taxes on their growing real estate footprint, but they reap the benefits of police and fire services, snow and trash removal, road maintenance, and other municipal services. These buildings that are created at universities also produce a financial gray area 
where you have tax exempt buildings where research is conducted that reap millions in commercial royalties, while surrounding property taxes and rental prices increase above the local means to compensate for the loss of public dollars. University hospitals receive tax exemption for indigent care, but focus on profitable care, cancer treatment and boutique services to the detriment of community services. Arizona State University is an egregious example where this public university leases out its tax exempt campus land to private companies in exchange for payments never seen by the state or its residents. Policing finally, these university citadels of wealth extraction are secured by the extended jurisdiction of campus police forces with public authority to police public neighborhoods with little public accountability. So what is the response? What can be done? People right now are in the streets calling for an anti-racist or abolition university. And as a part of scholars for social justice, we have put forth a politics of reparations, of repair. But here we imagine university reparations is not simply an ethic of historical correction, but it calls for the reconstruction of an institution that sits at the foundation of the US political economy. In just a story that I know, colleges and universities are the biggest employers, real estate holders, healthcare providers, and policers in big cities and college towns all across the country. So therefore, if the university is all encompassing in our political economy, then a reparations agenda must reimagine the campus as a commons. Community space in which the wealth extracted from community members is actually utilized to serve all community members. A campus commons is manifest in what Destin mentioned before, pilots payments and little taxes, but they cannot be voluntary. They must be mandatory. We must create community benefits agreements tied to all campus projects that include everything com from community centers and access to community facilities to affordable housing land trusts and zip code specific free education, living wage, job opportunities and procurement contracts, all governed by a community advisory board. Endowments must be moved from money market accounts to community banks and earmark a percentage to social justice spending, prison programs, low income financial aid, increase for wage workers. Community planning based planning and zoning boards must be created to craft neighborhood plans on all campus development projects. As a part of the police divest and invest movement, we must shift resources from armed police forces to decriminalize forms of community based public safety, like mental health counselors and crisis intervention safety. Labor must have a living wage with benefits on a 12 month cycle without regard to past criminal or credit history. Intellectual property royalties should be distributed fairly to all workers and to the communities in which the work is done. Athletic revenues, Pac, uh, students, black students and brown students in the Pac-12 are leading the way to say that monies should go to worker athletes and to the communities from which they come. So as we think through austerity, as aust not as being a lack, but as a particular kind of extraction, as we come to realize how much higher education extends into our life in ways that have nothing to do with education, we begin to understand the importance of our convening here today, in this moment, at this time, with this purpose of freedom building. Universities are places that want to know, but they don't want to be known. So as we think and act here together, let us ruminate on the gravity of this discussion and broad implications of campus austerity. University spreadsheets reveal much broader struggles over neighborhood displacement, living wages, intellectual property rights, universal health care, wealth redistribution, police abolition. Higher education is no longer just academic. Waging this battle today against the violence of campus austerity is a critical staging ground for the complete and total transformation of our lives. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jafarian. Frank. Oh, and I'm sorry, before you start, I just want to remind everyone to post your questions in the chat and on Facebook Live. 
Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Frank Deal. I teach at CUNY Law School. And I also would like to thank uh, Scholars for Social Justice for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this very, very important discussion regarding universities' austerity uh, and racism. Uh, the university that uh, uh, the Varian spoke about sounds very much like the university that I actually went to for law school. Uh, as he was speaking, I was sort of thinking about the, the application of that model uh, to the City University of New York, uh, where I happen to teach. Uh, CUNY is, um, uh, uh, I think, a very interesting, in fact, fascinating campus. It's one of the uh, largest universities in the world. Uh, we uh, school over 500,000 students. Uh, we award uh, 55,000 degrees uh, every year. Uh, most of the students at the City University of New York are in fact students of color. Uh, that is by no means the case of the people who work at the City University and by no means is that the case uh, for the faculty uh, of the City University. Uh, so far as I know, uh, the university gets uh, this substantial amount of its budget uh, from the state, uh, from the city of New York, as well as from uh, tuition uh, from the students. Uh, however, uh, interesting uh, that this happened just yesterday, but uh, we learned uh, that the university actually received a $10 million grant uh, from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, a private source, of course, uh, to essentially look into uh, the way the university is dealing with the pandemic and some of the racial justice issues which have uh, been on the horizon, especially since uh, the death of uh, George Floyd. i like to talk a little bit about uh, the reaction uh, of activist uh, groups, including the union at the university, in dealing with uh, what certainly appears to us uh, to be a form of austerity. Uh, the governor of New York uh, announced uh, to the university that uh, because of the uh, cost of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, that the university is going to be facing a $95 million budget cut, $95 million. Uh, what does that mean? Certainly it means uh, cuts in program for students uh, and serious cuts in terms of the faculty. As uh, some of you may know, uh, as soon as the announcement came down, uh, the university took the step of essentially not renewing uh, the contracts of over 2,800 adjunct faculty. 2,800 adjunct faculty. That is more faculty uh, than consists entirely of many universities throughout the world. Um, how do we essentially deal with that? Uh, well, unlike um, most faculty uh, at the City University, uh, we do in fact uh, have a union which represents us. And I'm not here speaking as an officer of the union. I was an officer of the union in the past, but I am an activist member. I consider myself to be an activist member of that union. Uh, as you can imagine with the struggles that we see ourselves going into as, as a consequence of the pandemic and budget cuts, uh, activities are taking place uh, on campuses uh, throughout the university. We have groups of faculty talking to each other, faculty student groups talking to each other across campus. Uh, the union provides a serious backstop uh, to those discussions. We're trying to trigger our actions to a lot of the faculty governance groups throughout the university. Uh, but one thing about having a union, uh, which faculty governance groups are not able to essentially provide, uh, and that is that one of the interesting things that the union did was it went to court. Uh, essentially filing a lawsuit in a federal court, uh, trying to get the judge uh, to order the university to use the funding that Congress provided in the CARES Act to essentially hold on to those adjunct faculty. As you probably know, that uh, legislation um, was uh, designed in part to essentially try to keep the pieces of this economy together in light of the pandemic uh, and a very important piece of that was to keep employers uh, from essentially laying off workers, the same thing that CUNY turned around and did the instant it got notice uh, of these budget cuts. Uh, so the point of the lawsuit was to essentially uh, raise the legal question as to whether CUNY was living up to its obligations under that statute uh, and laying off so many uh, adjunct faculty. Uh, we got some bad news from the court less than a week ago that the court was not going to issue a preliminary injunction to essentially require that CUNY keep those adjuncts on. Uh, we'll see where that litigation goes, but it's clear that we cannot rely on the courts to essentially fight the struggle. 
Uh, as I said before, uh, we have a number of uh, faculty student organizations that are talking uh, across campus to essentially deal with ways to struggle uh, against the uh, oncoming uh, budget cuts that are taking place. Um, uh, there was an African American uh, faculty group which is speaking where we sort of learn uh, what's happening at each one of the colleges trying to gather statistics in terms of uh, what the small percentage of African American faculty will look like after these budget cuts essentially take place. We're trying to protect programs which are certainly in the line of being destroyed in light of uh, the numerous uh, layoffs that we've in fact seen. Uh, we certainly have to do some uh, heavy uh, inquiring about uh, this money that uh, the Mellon Foundation has provided to the university. Because as I said, if you look at the um, news release, that money is specifically targeted to keeping in place uh, programs for um, black students uh, and um, uh, dealing with the uh, reaction to the uh, COVID, COVID uh, phenomenon. Uh, so um, um, I, I think this uh, budget crisis is real. This is not the first one we've seen. Uh, it probably is one of the most serious ones that we've seen. Uh, as I said, the union, I think, is doing uh, the best that it can. But, uh, you know, this is something which is hitting all the campuses at essentially the same time. Normally, the union is dealing with flare-ups involving individual circumstances at individual campuses. This is like everything coming down on everybody uh, at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, organizing work taking place in terms of educating the public about the value of the university, a value which goes beyond educating students. You know, we provide numerous services to the community. Uh, the law school has a clinic where people can walk in off the street and essentially get representation for certain types of cases. Uh, we've tried to put in place a plan whereby faculty at the university would essentially uh, lend their services to help parents who were struggling uh, to educate their kids in a situation where the kids are, and everyone's concerned about the kids going back to school and the parents having to work at home. How is it that, is there a way that we can use our expertise as educators uh, to uh, bring uh, parents out of the difficulties that they are in fact uh, having to face under these circumstances? Uh, so we have a lot of issues uh, confronting us. And, um, you know, as I said, um, uh, my uh, law school, uh, has, you know, a huge endowment, a huge endowment, which it uh, doesn't want to touch to deal with these particular circumstances. Uh, if CUNY has a huge endowment, uh, I don't know where it is, right? We, as I said, get a lot of our money from uh, the city and state governments. And when the taxpayers can't uh, pay their taxes because they're not working, uh, that's going to hit us. Uh, so that's kind of what our struggle is. Uh, as I said, we have a very, very active, vigorous union, uh, which I support 100%, but the union can't do this alone, right? I mean, it's going to take uh, massive mobilization amongst faculties and communities to essentially uh, keep the CUNY that we've known, that we've depended on, uh, going through this very, very uh, difficult circumstance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Deal. Uh, Barbara? You're on mute, uh, on mute, Barbara. Sorry. Um, I just felt like I heard our whole 30 year, our last 30 year plan be talked about on this panel and all the things that we've been pushing and fighting for and doing um, in this moment and in the past. Um, um, so I just wanna say one, let me just start by saying good morning, good evening. Thank you to the Scholar Social Justice for inviting me to this panel. Um, this, and so I want to just lay out a couple of things. I, I, I wrote something that I wanted to say, but listen to everybody. I got to speak from my heart and what, the things that we've been doing. Just recently, we led a 500 car caravan to circle the whole Yale's campus because um, not only just for um, we're in the middle of contract negotiations, but also our community is hurting, right? Yale is in a is a is like a moat is in a sea of poor poverty all circled all around it. Um, and we have been leading this austerity campaign around Yale pay your fair share. We have a 300 billion, no, wait a minute, a 30 billion dollar institution that if they pay their fair share to our city, 
their taxes would be $157 million. And if they just paid a portion of that, our city can be different, right? Like so many other cities, our city went from a manufacturing um, economy to now we are the college town. Yale New Haven Hospital, Yale University is it in this city, right? If you want a good job, and we fought hard over the last four decades to make our jobs not just have a, like decent jobs with fair wages, but to have really good living wages with really good benefits here at Yale. And we see over and over again, as um, they get richer and richer, they're trying to put, peel back our, um, our benefits and lower our standard. We have some of the be best standards in the region. Um, so let me just go a little bit into what we have done. Um, I want to say um, in, two, um, in 2003 was a game changer for us here at Yale. We, we did go on strike, but what we did when we went on strike, we went on strike for our lives. These jobs was below market value. What we did at that point in time, we changed the dynamics. Um, our jobs now became really good living wages, like I said earlier. But not only that, we, create, we started a, um, a different partnership with the community. Right. It wasn't just about how we can um, move forward, um, because, you, you know, if you move forward and you're not bringing people with you, it's easier for them to pull you back down. So we created a real um, partnership with the community. In 2011, what we did was a lot of our members, like I said, our community, our, uh, the New Haven community was plagued with crime no youth activities like so many other um, inner cities, no programs for our seniors, and our education system was very poor. Um, we, a bunch of our members started saying, well, what do we need to do to change it? And we know we got to not only change it from inside the institution, but we also got to look at how we are changing that outside the institution. We ran a bunch of people for the Board of Alders. A bunch of our members was like, I want to be on the town council because I want to affect change in our community. And so we ran a bunch of people. We didn't know whether we was going to win or not, but guess what? We won. We ran, I think we ran like 18 people and 17 of those people won. If people want to start taking back their communities and their neighborhoods and holding institutions in their neighborhoods accountable, we actually got to be a part of the solution that we want. And so we, we did that. And we have been on a path to one we created a um, universe uh, jobs pipeline for New Haven residents because one of the hardest things to do, even though we live in New Haven, the hardest thing was for a New Havener to get a job at Yale, right? It was the hardest thing. And not only just get the, um, the jobs in like, in the, in the dining halls and in, 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 in custodial, but we needed some of those higher level paying jobs, like in the labs, we needed training programs, we needed things, a gateway that actually get us into the university so people can have what we have. And for the, the last, I want to say 30 or 40 years, I mean, the last 30 years, we've been fighting for that and we actually want it. And now we have, we have a New Haven program that's a pipeline for New Haven, um, for um, New Haven residents. And we haven't done it by ourselves because we can't. We have a, a community program. I think as a union, if you want those changes, you have to invest in those things, um, in those programs, that's gonna make things happen for not only you, but for the community that you, uh, that you work in. And so we have a community program called New Haven Rising in which is our community-based program. And we have a set of community organizers that go out talk to the community. We have meetings to talk about what we're doing inside Yale, but also what we need to be doing outside of Yale to hold them accountable. Um, as people know, for years and years, we had um, local, um, it used to be called GSO, but now it's local 33, our graduate students um, organizing in which we, is, we are we're part of a bigger coalition of people that come together and to deal with the so, social and economic justice in New Haven. In Sun, we have undergraduate students that um, what, that's fighting for um, financial aid um, for Yale to repeal. And when they say that they're giving you a, a free education, Free education actually need to be free and not that the students are actually paying, uh, um, they're paying a portion of that by saying this is your student contribution that you have to pay, you have to work off to get that education. And so when, and so I think 
it, it takes a village to hold. Like we will never ever be able to outspend. Yeah. But the one thing we do is we have people capital and we have people that we can mobilize, right? And getting more and more people and raising the awareness about what is happening in our city, in our town, and how Yale can pay their fair share. Asking Yale to step up, asking institutions to step up and partnering, because I think that is the key. The key is partnering with the communities to, to um, as Professor Dell said, like the union can't do it by, its, by themselves. Definitely can't. But like being on a panel like this and seeing people all around are fighting for the same thing, right? As these institutions are becoming more and more corporations. Like I don't think of Yale, I work, I come out of the medical school and I don't think about Yale as being a, I think of it being a university because I grew up in New Haven. I grew up uh, about, uh, about two blocks up from Yale and never ever realized how wonderful this institution was. Never thought that I would actually be working here because I thought I was going to get a job at the manufacturing company when I graduate. But not only do I think, um, when I think about Yale, and when, um, is that it provides, when we fight for economic justice, social justice, it changes the lives of the people around these institutions. And that's what they need to realize, right? I come, I'm a poor girl coming from the projects, the worst projects in New Haven, but I was able to put three of my kids through college because I had a good union job at a good institution that had money that we could hold accountable, right? And I think more and more we need to be figuring out how do we um, hold these, these institutions accountable? Um, we did another campaign around redlining, right? Um, when we go back and our researchers went back and they looked and they looked back um, some 30, 40 years, our, these same communities that surround the university, where the, uh, where the communities got predatory lending, that had their um, more, their more foreclosures, more hospital debts, even the people who work at Yale, have their homes foreclosed on and have hospital deaths that have leaned on, them, on their houses, right? And then when we fast forward to today, though these same communities are the communities that's um, hit the worst with COVID, right? And there's things that we have to hold um, these institutions accountable for and being better partners to the community in which they are in and, and, um, and to their workers and how to... Um, and how do we deal with the super tax exempt status when the state don't have money, when the cities don't have money, and the taxes on homeowners are going up and up and up, which forces people to leave those towns and which now allows them to have a bigger footprint. As um, I, I know I live in New Hallville in New Haven and Yale is encroaching, encroaching, encroaching more in our neighborhood and pushing us out, out, out because we can't afford to live here. Um, but what I would, and so, and my in my closing, I will just want to say um, I am so delighted to be on this panel and to be amongst all, all, all these great people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you to all of the panelists. You know, I see us all together um, and you all trying to really come to terms with what Barbara ended with, which is all the ways, right, that the university is um, functioning like a corporation. And we have some really great questions in the chat about differences and overlaps um, in those functions. And I just want to throw out as an initial question, you know, given what you all discussed together, right, which is, to my mind, a type of racial capitalist plunder, right, a type that functions in our context of a neoliberal turn, the increased corporatization of the university. I'm just wondering generally if y'all can elaborate on um, the kinds of progressive changes that you want you see as possible. Maybe like the thing you think is most vital and most important strategically um, that could create the greatest margin of change and sort of opening up a general question along those lines before going into some of the more specific ones. Sort of what could create the biggest change right now Well, I just want to, uh, if, I, if I can jump in real quick, I just want to say that, for example, during the pandemic, a number of critical issues were highlighted or clarified 
that were critical. The degree to which universities um, control uh, the the way the wage the wage ceiling in cities all over the country is vital, so that when the pandemic hit and universities were closed, that decimated the labor forces of cities all across the country. And what happened, for example, with Harvard is that they were going to make the, they were making the argument that they were not going to um, furlough or compensate uh, the subcontracted workers. They were only going to compensate those who were directly employed by the university. There was such a massive backlash by alumni and students that they retraced their steps on doing that. So that kind of labor struggle, I think, is critical because we have to think about to what degree uh, the campus is a shop floor for the cities in which they sit. Um, on top of that, UChicago, for I think it was eight, eight weeks, they decided during the pandemic to take unused or unprocessed foods that were um, created or produced or harvested in their, in their cafeterias and turn them into meals and distribute them to the communities around the campus. Why couldn't that be done on a regular basis? That food gets thrown out every day. So for me, I don't know if there's a one big thing, but I just feel like the pandemic highlighted either through the pushback from community members around the way universities are acting or the small piecemeal gestures made by universities to reach out beyond their campus walls. It showed what's possible if universities act right all the time and not just simply when pushed during a pandemic. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I, I feel like the question also um, relates to something Barbara mentioned. So let me just kind of punctuate the point on the relationship between universities and cities. So again, if, if universities are not paying their fair share of taxes, that means a decline in revenues in the surrounding communities. Uh, and that is because of the power of finance capital, because of the dependence of cities on the municipal bond market because of the interpretive hegemony of credit rating analysts. They're gonna to point to declining revenues and increased expenditures as effectively a penalty and as a higher interest cost. And so what that means is in the immediate, you're going to have city residents in a place like New Haven, uh, basically picking up the slack through these regressive taxes, through property taxes in the immediate and long-term, once the interest penalty kicks in, paying it long-term as well. Um, so just that relationship between the city and the university, and I don't know, I mean, this is a question also for DeVarian, whether or not it makes sense to think about this as a kind of metropole colony sort of periphery relationship. I mean, periphery, of course, is not, you know, far removed. It literally is just outside the campus gates. Uh, but how to understand that relationship. But, but then going back to Sarah Haley, uh, to Sarah's question, I mean, I think there's a political argument here, right? And, and I know folks are uh, hesitant to latch on to the taxpayer argument, that is to say, we're all taxpayers, right? Some of us are not just moochers, right? Through regressive taxes, we pay taxes too. Um, but I think that sort of insisting that universities need to pay their fair share, we can guard against some of the more reactionary claims that only corporations, only white homeowners are taxpayers, and thus uh, those who don't pay taxes, so to speak, uh, have less uh, citizenship claims and claims to sort of political representation. So I think just in terms of discourse and political organizing, one way to sort of uh, guard against those reactionary forces is to, to kind of latch on to the argument that universities need to pay their fair share. And of course, there's how to qualify and quantify even what counts as fair share is, is, is you know, contingent and, and people should you know, it, it, it's no sort of formula, right? We shouldn't totally rely on the kind of quantitative metric. Um, but I think that that's one way to sort of think about the pilot program uh, in Philadelphia with, uh, with, with UPenn faculty to again, guard against that reactionary element, uh, which oftentimes does fragment so many movements, again, as people make claims to being a taxpayer and other folks as moochers. Uh, I'd also like to take a crack at uh, Sarah's question um, you know, as I was talking about being at a public university um, uh, and the, the reality that we, I do see serious financial issues that we are confronting, uh, we still have gone through the same type of corporatization that other universities have gone through. Uh, in other words, uh, over the past, uh, you know, 40 years, uh, we've seen uh, the university become top heavyweight administrators who receive enormous, enormous salaries, sometimes two, three times what faculty members in fact make. Uh, we see them pushing a corporate agenda where they kind of see students as consumers uh, and faculty as essentially sellers of, of, of the product of knowledge uh, that the university essentially profits upon. We've seen that in the public sector as well as in the private sector. 
And what I think I'm hoping to see from this COVID thing is a real attack on that because first of all, people are wondering where's the money gonna come from and where's the money going? We can no longer stand to have these expensive bureaucrats essentially calling the shots at the university because at the same time that these folks have come in, uh, the role of the faculty has been diminished, right? We've been marginalized but in, 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 at the behest of this corporate structure. I think that's beginning to change. And even in faculties that are not unionized like ours happens to be, we see this pushback. You know, there was this pressure coming from, from Trump and others to get everybody back into the classroom, notwithstanding all the health consequences of that. And, you know, just three weeks ago, all these universities were saying, we're opening up, we're opening up. But now we see they're turning back. I think that's because the faculty has been saying, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. We're not going to be your peons in this, in, this, in this marketplace. So, you know, notwithstanding all the troubles coming from this pandemic, conceivably there can be some good out of that if the faculty can in fact uh, be able to uh, stand up to this bureaucratization of the university and tell these corporate folks that, you know, we're not people who can be moved around like on a chessboard to essentially increase the profits of these institutions. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we have those same issues. The other thing I want to say uh, is that in stemming and dealing with this in terms of, you know, really making work of the awful death of George Floyd and others, uh, when we're all talking about race issues, we need to get our numbers up on the campuses, right? At the law school, we, you know, our numbers are, are, are getting, getting larger, thank goodness. Uh, we're not all tenured yet, but our numbers are getting larger. We put out a tremendous statement, which was designed to sort of not just look at what's happening in the world at large, but looking at how we are running that institution. How are we running the law school? Who's benefiting? Who's not benefiting? What do we have to change to really make this institution one which is going to represent uh, our values, which is law in the service of uh, human needs? So I am hoping that, you know, uh, we can investigate where this money from the Mellon Foundation is going to go within CUNY because that money was earmarked for essentially boosting black faculty and boosting black programs on the CUNY campus. And I think if we get our numbers up at other schools, we can fight that same struggle. Uh, so I, I, I think there's a lot that hopefully we can make good out of this terrible situation that we are confronting. Um, we have three questions, at least three questions on the chat that all relate to the incredible insights you all have had around the public private divide, you know, which is what we've just been talking about. And um, specifically folks wanting us to think about um, the relationship between private universities and the publics, right, that they occupy. And I'm thinking about Barbara's really like um, powerful, right, analysis of her own positionality, right, what it means to grow up in a place, um, work at a place, and then think about the sort of corporatization and economic structure of a place. So that's one sort of category of questions that uh, um, around public and private. But then there's also a set of questions around um, the relationship that you all are outlining between public and private universities, the differences um, um, and similarities that um, Professor Deal was just describing, right, in terms of the corporatization at all of these institutions, but the vastly different economic circumstances. Um, and so how do we think about those dynamics and what we might, the challenges we might raise in light of them? And so one of the things I was just thinking about in relationship to this question is, um, there's a question about what we might do. Adam Getachu asked what we might do um, in addition to payments in lieu of taxes, right? Um, to get at these, these questions. And I'm wondering if there's a demand for a sort of university mutual aid, right? Um, program. So we think about mutual aid in a kind of feminine, feminized way, right? In terms of small circles, but in addition, to be clear, in addition to Real, real meaningful payments in lieu of taxes, should these universities, should Columbia University um, be paying, right, um, a mutual aid payment to CUNY, right? How do we think about knowledge in relationship to um, inter interwoven institutions and the sort of rhetoric of the public good that private institutions use and mobilize? Um, in relationship to the other institutions um, that are producing knowledge. So it's just one thought that occurred to me as you all were speaking, but I'm wondering if you have other ideas 
sort of about the public private specifically because um, several people have asked about that. Well, Go ahead, Dave. Uh, you got it. <laughs> well, well, first of all, yeah, we do have to acknowledge that there are significant, there, there, there have been, I won't say there are, there have been profound differences between public universities and private universities in terms of um, their endowments, in terms of who they service as students. And so we have to acknowledge that there are public universities that have a state mandate to service the citizens within their state, the residents. Um, there are community colleges and junior colleges, depending on which state you live in, that are more directly embedded within the communities in which they serve um, that we really talk about that dynamic. We must talk about, you know, the big, the big R1s, et cetera, or the, or the Michigans or whatever, the Virginias. But there are these community colleges and junior colleges that have a mandate that do serve, that do provide models for how to repair or reconstruct this relationship between the universities and the communities that do surround them. But as Professor Deal pointed out, the corporatization of even public universities is growing and must be acknowledged. We, we, we now know that in many uh, uh, public universities, the state expenditure over the last 30 years has decreased from sometimes 60% to as little as 20%. So what do these universities have to do? They have to go out there and get money. They got to find private relationships with investors, with developers, with um, outside contractors, um, to find ways to compensate for these losses. Um, and so this is why you're seeing a more a, a greater parity between public universities and private universities. In terms of, um, you know, what we can do differently uh, or what can be some forms of resistance or reconstruction. This is why I'm, I'm thinking of using the word reconstruction more than repair, because the idea is that repair, and I think Destin and, and Barbara point this out, it's, it suggests um, a noblesse oblige or doing a public good or doing something, it, dis, it, it doesn't acknowledge the existing relationships between these institutions and the communities in which they sit. So reconstruction for me is about an acknowledgement and engagement with how, what's the actual relationship versus simply some claims of benevolence for you don't have, and so out of our goodness of our heart, we're gonna give. It's no saying you have because of your pillaging of the institution neighborhoods that surround you. And so we're asking for a reconstruction of the, exist, the conditions that already exist. And so you have, for example, at Yale, New Haven Rising, you have them being able to powerfully claim, and Barbara can speak to this more better than I can, you know, um, 300, you know, the victory of 300 jobs guaranteed, every, you know, for neighborhoods that are targeting neighborhoods of need that surround uh, uh, Yale. You have the, 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 the month long campaign at, um, at Johns Hopkins against the creation of a public of a private police force. Um, they lost that campaign, but with um, the, 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 the social actions against police brutality and police injustice, they have forced Johns Hopkins to suspend that police force for two years. And we hope that within those two years, we can abolish that police force. Um, they're they're uh, uh, UPenn and their campaigns for the pilot. Uh, there are campaigns all over the country for the renaming of buildings uh, and, and acknowledging their relationships to slavery or Jim Crow or urban renewal. All right, so this is an ongoing process. So you have these, the, uh, the, the divest campaign at UCLA, um, campaigns against divestment at, um, at uh, a, a, a lot of schools are engaging in divestment campaigns, USC, uh, Northwestern, U Chicago. So there are those things. But actually, in a way, the public schools, K through 12 public schools on divestment are doing better than universities. Mm -hmm. They are, and this might be a public-private you know, reality that we can speak about more. They are actually being more successful in getting uh, police forces out of or off their campuses in a way that uh, universities have not been as uh, uh, successful at doing. So I'm gonna stop, but I'm just saying, these are the things I'm thinking about in terms of number one, um, the, the difference between public and private, and number two, the ways in which people are fighting back, are pushing back. Um, uh, Sarah, you mentioned mutual aid. Um, the kind of the the the, the term of, of the field in university studies is the community the community benefits agreement. So that does exist, but at Columbia they actually have one, but it was put in the hands of individuals who are in the pockets of, of politicians. And so the benefits aren't actually getting to the community. So we have to be careful to understand that the CBA is not an end all to be all. We have to be very vigilant in how it gets distributed and managed by the community in which it, serve, it claims to serve. So I'll stop there. 
You know, on, on the public private uh, question, uh, really appreciate those questions. I mean, I guess, I guess it's worth kind of holding on to a distinction here between the, the ideological distinction between public private and the material uh, realities of the public private. And what I mean by that is, I think there's actually a uh, utility and a benefit of holding on to what the public university and public schools and public parks actually represent and the need to kind of hold on to, pub to the public as an ideal to reject racial capitalism. At the same time, as we hold on to the kind of ide ideological distinction between the public and the private, we can't miss the ways in which public institutions, as Professor Deal has mentioned, have become more corporatized. And actually the distinction lets private institutions off the hook for the exact reasons I mentioned at the beginning, right? They borrow from the tax exempt bond market, which is supposed to be for public purposes to build private facilities. So on the one hand, I do recognize the importance that there are distinctions and, and some people I do know colleagues who, for instance, wanna teach at public un universities and institutions, wanna defend the post office, right? I recognize that ideological and political commitment at the same time that when we think about the financing, for instance, we actually, we actually see that it's really difficult to figure out where the public ends and where the private begins and et cetera. So, um, so there's that. I mean, and, and I think Adam had asked uh, to what end uh, is it worth thinking about the distinction or blurring the distinction between public and private. I think it goes back to something Professor Baldwin had mentioned in terms of the commons, the idea of turning these pri so-called private institutions into a common space. Um, and then I think it's also about rejecting the interpretive claims, again, disabling the interpretive claims of universities who insist that uh, the university, private universities like U Chicago, is in fact private, to instead say that when you actually follow the funds, this is the usage of public funds to build private facilities. And as such, we reject the claims of police departments that they are safeguarding private property from outsiders. You reject that move and you also reject the insistence from universities that these, this is a private space. And they, as such, they have the right to write their ordinances and decide who comes in and out. Um, so, so that to me is the, the purpose of trying to, um, uh, at least in terms of private institutions, try to upset the divide by following the funds, again, to, to reject that uh, interpretive hegemony, if you will. Um, but for Professor Baldwin, I would love to hear you say a bit more about the commons as well, right? Like, so, and that's, I think, to Adam's question, like, to what end, once we reject this distinction, despite holding on to perhaps the difference between the ideological commitment and the material uh, realities of the public-private institution, uh, to what end, and what does the commons look like? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've spoken before about being blown away by what I saw at institutions like the University of, of Winnipeg in Canada and what they've been able to do to build. Um, they rejected um, outside contractors to build their buildings on that campus and created their own community development corporation that um, create, you know, and it, it has its own limitations, don't get me wrong. But then, but then because it had a mandate of sustainability, four pillars of sustainability that were social, economic, ecological, and, and, and um, interpersonal. So then they were, they were driven by a mandate of sustainability in this broad sense. And so therefore that shaped the kind of building they did. They built housing on their campus that was accessible to both residents in the city and students. And it was built so that all the units were interchangeable at a, a, a premium rate, market rate, affordable rate and rate geared to income. And they were all the, all the housing were the same. But they had, but pe the people carried with them different financial capacities, and so there was things like they they, they rejected Aramark and Marriott as to doing the food service and created a, a community, a university-based food service company um, that had the mandate again based on sustainability that sixty-five percent of the workers that came there had to be workers of need, those who were difficult to um, to employ, that were queer, that were. Um, uh, uh, had recently, had been incarcerated, were new Canadians, what we call immigrants, uh, were residents of color. So because they had this kind of commoning or sustainability framework, they were engaging in some of the same practices that university engaged in, but they were governed and distributed and administered in drastically, radically different ways. So I think that some of that visioning can be brought here, or for example, I mentioned the idea of a community advisory board over a um, a community-based planning, planning, planning and zoning board. So any uh, community uh, university development or expansion that goes on in our communities must be governed by a community-based advisory board. So therefore, that it must be designated and clear that it has benefits for the communities in which it sits. 
uh, the community benefits agreements being pushed for at the University of Chicago with the Obama Library. Um, you know, the idea that, and, and we see now with administrators and some politicians, uh, um, um, all the persons on the South side are saying that we need to have a affordable housing land trust and affordable housing uh, 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 tax trust that says that as property values go up with investments in this neighborhood, we need some money to be set aside so that certain parts of the neighborhood are reserved for affordable housing or certain budgets are reserved so that when property taxes go up with development, that we have money to compensate for those losses. So I think that these are some things that can be done to signal towards what commenting could mean um, in real time. Uh, I would like to um, uh, focus on uh, what Barbara talked about as um, growing up sort of in the shadow of Yale and New Haven. Uh, because uh, I was just intrigued by, you know, the struggle going on to essentially get uh, the university there to essentially give back to the community in some, in some form, whether it's taxes or, or, or something else. Uh, it seems to me that in situations like that, you know, communities should be organized to really put demand, demands on these institutions to provide some sort of recompense uh, because um, to see the, just the glaring disparities between how people are living uh, on the Yale campus and how people are living three blocks away, it's just, it's just absolutely extraordinary and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's unacceptable. Um, so, but just like I think that that should be a real campaign for, you know, New Haven and places like Yale, I also think that, uh, you know, a public university like CUNY can't sort of give back in the same way that uh, like Yale would, or Penn would give back, but we still, I think, should put expectations, right, you know, on, the, on faculty, on the university community to essentially, you know, try to do things that are going to support the community. I think a lot of that takes place already, and I kind of mentioned uh, some of the circumstances where I think that happens, but I think it almost, it has to be almost like an obligation upon faculty, and I think that's going to involve essentially redefining or expanding ideas of uh, scholarship, expanding ideas of community service uh, so that those things which are normally looked at in terms of who gets promoted and who gets tenured, that those things encompass some sort of a university and community involvement whereby the university is looked at, whether it's public or private, is really doing something to benefit communities in this country that surround uh, the university. I think in the crisis that this country is facing going into the future, that's the only way universities can survive. Because, you know, I mean, the, the writing was on the wall with so many of these colleges, right? I mean, a friend of mine was uh, talking the other day, he teaches at a small, I think it's a state university in Michigan, how they faced the entire college just shutting down, right? Facing little shutdown, if not the entire college, certainly departments within that college. So there has to be some sort of transformation which is taking place on campuses uh, to essentially connect with these communities so that you know, they're struggling together rather than sort of working it out at opposing uh, ends of this battle. Mm. Um, okay, well, I, I think- I would say more about the, the campaigns in New Haven. I mean, I think it would be great if Barbara could you know, uh, speak. God, I've been amazed and, 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 and inspired by what you know, uh, uh, Unite and, and New Haven Rising has been able to do um, in, you know, in New Haven, you know, if, if that's possible. Yeah, I, I was thinking specifically because Barbara has organized extensively around community benefits agreements, you know, for so many years, as you mentioned, Devarian. So um, I think that would be great. And, and the question of vision, Barbara, if we could pull you into something from that organizing that you, that ha, um, has sort of occurred to you as a kind of key vision for the future. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the key vision for us is like, how do we as a community prosper as Yale prospers, right? How do we have other places around us prosper? Um, and, and, and I think the, um, the light that was shed, like, um, I, I don't know if people remember or uh, probably know, in the beginning of the pandemic, when um, the mayor of the city went to Yale and asked Yale when they opened up their dorms for the poly, for our um, for our essential workers, Yale said no. But UNH um, down the road say yes, and it put pressure on Yale then to say, oh no no, we'll open up our dorms, and not only we open up our dorms, we'll do a little bit more. Um, but I do think it takes things things like that to. Um, 
and, and, and to, to move things. But I think for us in the future, and I think the things that we're looking at, right, um, is how do we um, really address austerity in our community and our communities um, through not only through um, employment, because that actually makes the difference a lot for people in the community, but um, for us at Yale, yeah, how do we um, maintain our jobs and make our jobs good jobs, but also um, how do we keep raising the ceiling for other or for other um, employers coming into the city, right? How do we um, um, raise that, um, raise the, for that? The thing about our union and Unite Here, people might not know, I want to say about 90% of our members were hit really hard through the pandemic. They were laid off. A lot of them work at public schools, at, um, at universities, in the, in the kitchen, because our, our um, industry is um, restaurant, hotel workers, and people who work in the public sector. And that industry was hit really hard. The things that we have been pushing for um, is that one healthcare, right? Because there's such a disparity in our communities around healthcare, and how do we push for um, for these companies um, to provide healthcare throughout the pandemic? How do we get people um, them to um, focus on technology? It's um, I, I hope I'm not off base on what I'm saying, but um, how do we start looking at technology and how do we get people into those higher level positions and how do we um, have form real partnerships? Um, those are the things that we're looking at. How do, um, how do we combat those things in the future? Um, uh, so I think, yeah, so that's what I think those are the things that we are, we are working on. Um, the biggest thing and the biggest fight for us is the taxation. Right, because um, I think she froze. Did we lose you, Barbara? I think she froze. Okay. Yeah. Um, hopefully, she she'll come back mm -hmm. to us. And I think we have time for one last question. So hopefully, we get Barbara back during this question. Um, and we have about ten minutes. We have a question from Amon Williams who asks, who says that he is struck by a comment that Dustin made earlier, positioning universities as nation states. And he says that given the ways in which austerity crises ask us to reconsider the stewardship of resources, what strategies might link struggles against the university or struggles, I guess, for a different kind of university with struggles against the settler state? And I'll add something in the mix to that, which is sort of, you know, the relationship between um, struggles against the settler state and um, struggles for reparations, right, for the harms um, imposed from slavery and its legacies. So um, I think this was inspired by this question of what is the university? Right? Is it a nation state? Is it a corporation? Um, Devarian, you mentioned the land grab university, right? Like, how do we confront these legacies? I've described the university as a mini republic in the past. Um, and I think this, this points back to, to Dustin's point about the public private and what everybody's talking about. And we mostly talked about the way in which um universities that become privatized but we also need to speak about the ways in which universities have been given public authority um in ways and, and, and you know in terms of um their educational status and tax in the tax code that's a public designation or in terms of their private police forces to um procure public neighborhoods um through their jurisdiction expansion that's a public designation and so um I just wanted to point that out. It's not answering the question that you're asking. I'm sorry, but I just want to say that I, just to point out how public and our strategies and our organizing, how it, it goes both ways, both the privatization of universities, but also the growing publicity, public power, the public authority of um, that's being uh, a kind of transferred to university power. But as I said at the end of my comments, you know, if we look at these institutions, I focus primarily on cities. I'm an urbanist. So when I talk about cities, I talk about them as universities, as my organizing logic, this degree to which universities are gaining this growing control over the normal functioning of urban life 
And so if we talk about coalition building and convergences between university campaigns and urban neighborhood campaigns, the struggles over neighborhood displacement or what we call gentrification, the struggle for living wages, the struggle for property rights, for health care, for wealth redistribution, for police abolition, these are struggles that are nationwide, that are urban specific in certain ways, but not urban exclusive, urban specific. And they are battles that are waged on campuses that become referendums on cities and the nation writ large. And so there's a way in which the university holds wider struggles in base relief. They crystallize, they highlight, they signal, they, they, they bring into sharp focus uh, uh, these conditions that are broader because of the degree to which the university extends its entrails into every aspect of our life in a way that we haven't talked about, that we're not talking about enough. And so I think that there's a way in which these, these, these conditions over housing, over policing, over healthcare, they, 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 they might start on universities, but they're always about the neighborhoods that encompass uh, the, the university's reach. And so I just want to say that. Yeah. Aman, um, really brilliant question. And, and um, I think maybe I was being a little provocative. I mean, but it's worth thinking about the distinction. I feel like the Varian, you're, you're kind of pushing us to think a little bit. Does it make sense to kind of think about universities as universities or as many republics and nation states? I mean, maybe they're not, not mutually exclusive. I'm not sure. But I mean, for me, what inspired that comment was, I remember I was a graduate student at Stanford and the orientation, it was like an earthquake uh, protocol, right? What to do if an earthquake happens. And I remember the comment was something like, well, we have backup generators and we have enough food to feed everybody on campus for months. I mean, that, that right there kind of inspired the comment that we're talking about public utilities, we're talking about backup food, and of course, these institutions who can regulate who comes in and out, right? Um, and the ways in which that's racialized and of course reinforced through, uh, the access point is reinforced through digital IDs and cards that you need to swipe to get into buildings and such. So anyway, that was kind of what inspired the comment. But I mean, I guess if you think about universities, right? Cities are also municipal corporations. Universities are increasingly becoming corporatized. So anyway, there's a distinction there, but really what matters to me is um, or what kind of links the, the precarity of the nation state um, or the changing status of the nation state is what it represents and the power thereof uh, during the early 20th century compared to this current moment and what's happening with universities at present is the power of finance. I mean, this is the ways in which bond rating analysts, bankers, underwriters have the ability to shape the terms of lending conditions and affect the kinds of distribution of resources that states, cities, and universities ultimately settle upon. So to me, it's the power of finance that, under, that undergirds both uh, the nation state and universities. And it's also, um, and, and precisely for that reason, it, it stresses the need for us to challenge the power of finance, to reject the interpretive hegemony that, hey, as a, unelected officials working for Moody's or Standard & Poor's, how is it that you have the right and say to determine which infrastructure and social services cities ultimately fund? I mean, it's about rejecting uh, the power of finance and their interpretive claims, um, as well as demanding federal financial power to obviate the private bond market entirely. And that goes for cities. That also goes for universities. So to me, it's that finance question that links the predicament of the nation state and universities. Uh, but again, I mean, I think it's the open question of whether or not it makes sense to conceptualize universities as nation states to begin with. I think it's also real quick, I think it's important to, on your last point, the financial point, is that finances are not stupid and they identify the murky designation of universities as well, whether they're public or private. The, the indeterminate, the, our inability to really clamp down on whether they're public or private, financiers are playing that in the middle. They're, they're, they're capitalizing on that murky designation to make universities this primary focal point for circulating and managing capital. So I just wanted to say that as well. I don't claim any expertise in uh, university finance, but uh, I think what um, uh, what I um, agree with very much is a statement I read not so long ago, which really described contemporary universities as essentially uh, hedge funds with classrooms attached to them. Uh, and I noticed if you look at, you know, the financial press, you're going to see these discussions of how these endowment managers at Yale and Harvard and Princeton and places like that, how they fared compared to the S&P 500. They're talking about these um, uh, universities is like, you know, just conglomerates of money. 
right? That's what they are. And the teaching becomes a secondary function of these places. So I, I think, of, you know, over time, this university have been different things. They play different roles in this country's development. But I'm fairly convinced that uh, this, uh, this pandemic can change universities, at least many universities can change them completely, if not actually wipe them out. Uh, and I think that we as faculty members, as people who are part of those universities, you know, really have to fight to sort of make those institutions what we want them to be, as opposed to what these, uh, you know, uh, hedge fund managers essentially want them to be. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, real quickly, is that because the, the profile of the wealthy, full paying family is diminishing in our society, you're finding universities uh, kind of pillaging Pell Grant, Pell Grant eligible students as the new market. And who are those? those that's our people. And so if these universities are going to start, see, the, the big universities are starting to seizing on Pell Grant eligible students, they're pulling them from Pell Grant eligible neighborhoods, depressed, divested neighborhoods. So how can we link the, uh, the, the insistence on trying to pillage our neighborhoods for the new generation of students that are carrying financial aid with them? How can we link that pillaging with the requirement? If you're going to come into our neighborhoods, there will be responsibilities attached to your attempting to capitalize on creating or turning our students, our people into a new market. That will come with certain designations, certain requirements, certain earmarks, certain protections. This will not happen without certain conditions being met where you can, it's not just simply about, oh, pulling up these poor black and brown kids into a college education. You're doing it because you see a financial benefit within the Pell Grant market. And we recognize that, and we're going to put uh, justifications and stipulations on that process as well. And I, I would also add the kind of labor, racialized labor extraction, right, that Barbara is describing and has been confronting at Yale combined with the kinds of expansion um, and plundering that you all are describing, which is a mode of conquest, right? If we think about that, the way the university is operating in cities and communities, um, I think we can see something here around this relationship between white supremacy, settler colonialism, and the functioning of a university in terms of public finance and public capital that's um, been really illuminating in your comments. So we are out of time. I am so motivated to do more work from this panel and so grateful for each of you um, for your incredible comments. Um, so much gratitude. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for your analysis and folks can continue to follow Scholars for Social Justice um, at scholarsforsocialjustice.com. Um, so uh, we're out of time. I wish we could keep going, but thank you. Thank you so much to each of you. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, right. Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks.